Hello, I'm Steve Thompson. This is our first chance to get together, and today we're very lucky to have with us Natsuki Okazawa, pianist. She's going to play a new work commissioned for piano, and uh, please help me welcome Natsuki. So we're going to talk with her a little bit about, uh, about her training and what she's been doing and all the concerts that she plays and all of that. And then she's going to actually play for us a piece that she's commissioned for piano. And so I wanted to start off, I just want to read a little bit of her bio for you, just so you know a little bit about her. And um, so uh, Natsuki is a Steinway artist, and Steinway is a piano uh, maker, uh, one of the most famous piano makers. And uh, her, her career has taken her through U.S. cities and to, and to Europe and Scandinavia and Israel and Australia, Brazil, Japan, and China. She's performed at uh, Carnegie Hall, the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., uh, Copenhagen's Tivoli Concert Hall. And she's won international prizes, including rare, uh, rave reviews in the Strad and Fanfare magazines, Best Chamber Music According of the Year from the Danish Music Awards in 2012. Uh, and is on the distinguished roster of international Steinway artists, has played concertos like uh, Gershwin's Concerto in F and Beethoven's Third and Fourth uh, Piano Concerto and Dagnani's Variations on a Nursery Song and Mozart and Rachmaninoff. Oh, Rocky too, Rachmaninoff's Second Piano Concerto, which is, is big. It's a lot of stuff here that she has done and traveled all over the world in recordings and she's taught here at American River College uh, for several years for us. Uh, also on uh, faculties at California State University of Sacramento, St. Mary's College in Moraga, and the University of Pacific. Uh, she's had students who've gone on to major conservatories in this country and, and around the world and have been on the show, the NPR show, uh, From the Top, which features, you know, young up-and-coming artists, which is, is, a, is a very cool show. You never check that out. And, uh, and then you studied and went to... Uh, Let's see, the Czech Republic, right? The Prague Academy there it was a Fulbright uh, scholar at the, at the Prague Academy, uh, or has a bachelor and master's degree from Juilliard in New York, and a doctorate from the University of Maryland. So uh, a resume as long as your arm. Yeah, we're lucky to have you here. But what I found very interesting when I was reading through this is that you started your piano studies with your mother. Yes. How was that? Studying Difficult. With your Difficult. It became was very your, difficult very fast, you know. <clears throat> was your mother uh, a nurturing kind of teacher or a uh, taskmaster? Or Should I be completely honest yes, on this? <laughs> yes, that makes it more fun. Um, well, it was fun at first because, you know, I was very young. and But, you know, for my mother is a professional piano, pianist and piano teacher, so she's, she is really uh, demanding and also very strict in that sense. And um, by the time I was eight, you know, we were clashing and yeah, yeah it's, it's difficult. Oh, it was yeah. challenging. Did, did you have like a certain number of hours you had to practice a day and that kind of thing? Oh, uh, in the beginning, not so much. Um, I, my mother taught in the afternoon. So when I came home from my school in elementary school in Japan, she would be always teaching. Mm. So I had to wait until she was finished teaching, and then I would be practicing during the time when she would be making dinner. And that was the time where my sister, I, had a young, I have a younger sister, she would be watching all the TV shows that everybody else was watching, and I wasn't allowed to watch it. <laughs> I was really were, resentful because yeah. I had to practice. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't happy about that. Yeah. But there was no other time to practice. And so you grew up in Japan then? Yes. And what, what part? Yokohama. Yokohama, uh -huh. which is, is that just south of Tokyo? Yes, yeah. it's about uh, an hour and a half yeah. south of Tokyo. It's right on the bay, but you will never notice that you have entered a new city because it's this con one continuous ginormous right. metropolis right. around the bay. <laughs> so how long did, then did you study in Japan with your mother? Did you continue on with other teachers there? At age eight, uh, oh. I transferred to a very famous piano teacher in Tokyo. And I commuted um, every Saturday, oh, wow. taking train by myself. Did you take the Shinkansen? To no, it? just a regular train. But <laughs> so you know, yeah, stops, yeah. Right? yeah. Mrs. Ishikawa is yeah. 
her name. And I used to live in Japan. I was like, you've got that's to right. be you, on the you lived in a Hirosh couple of times. Hiroshima, right? I did, and yeah. wow, that's really fun to do that. But you take the local trains and stop after stop. It must have taken quite a while to get It, it was at least hour and a half, yeah. one way, to, yeah. to the piano lesson on Saturday. And in the beginning, my mother came with me. But after a couple of years, I was on my own. Um, taking the train. And so it was kind of fun. So why not, did you then think about going to conservatory in Japan? Or is that, is well, that the I, point that you... Well, I moved to U.S. with my family. Oh. My father was transferred to L.A. Uh, when I was 13. So we all moved here. And then that changed my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big change. And so did you go to Prague first or to... Uh, no, to Juilliard New first. No, to Juilliard. I got two degrees from Juilliard and then... Um, I met Mr. Panenka, who teaches, t taught at the Prague Academy uh, at a music festival. Mm. And I really wanted to study with him because I loved Czech music, and I still do. Um, so I went to study with him on the Fulbright Scholarship. Mm. So what was the atmosphere? Like, if, if you don't know, Juilliard is like you know, our top conservatory of music in this country, one of the top conservatories in the world, right? And uh, what was the atmosphere like at Juilliard? Because I've heard all kinds of stories, like you know, razor blades between the keys and the pianos, and all these kinds of things. Was it yeah. was it like that? Um, no razor blades. I I did hear about that too. When I was there, and it may be really different now, you know. But when I was there, I found it really tough. Yeah, it was extremely um, competitive. Very competitive, mm -hmm. and you know, if you were playing a piece that somebody else knew, they, they would be playing next door to you faster and louder. Right. <laughs> you know, right. that kind of atmosphere. Oh, yeah, like walking down the halls yeah, and hearing what someone else is playing and then going in. Yeah, and then they'll, s yeah. or if you're learning a new piece of music, they'll say, oh, I learned that when I was eight. Right. <laughs> you know, to Some make you games. feel bad. Right. And bad and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know it can be very stressful. I know when I was in school, you know, a pianist got so stressed out before a recital, she took a bucket of water and just dumped it in this beautiful you know, Steinway, nine foot grand, and and I'd be just run the instrument, but she was just so like done with with all of that. So you hear these stories. What like happened to the the student? Did she get to stay? I think, I think they they let her go. <laughs> yeah, I think oh my they expelled gosh, her. that's terrible. But uh, but you hear these kinds of things that go yeah. on. Like that. It, it made me really a tough person. So when I moved to Prague. I couldn't believe how nice people were. Oh. You know, yeah, how, yeah. everybody was so nice and friendly. Yeah. It's like, wow. Well, you were this at the conservatory in Prague. Yes, yeah. academy. Oh, the academy. Yeah, the conservatory is actually pre-college oh, there, okay, okay. and the academy is the college level. And so the atmosphere was different there. Totally different. Yeah, yeah. people more yeah. supportive and all of that. I was like, wow. Yeah. I, I have real friends here. A lot of attendance is better at, I think, sometimes too. But you know, the funny thing is now. That you know, there's was was on that all online media and social media. I'm connected with all the Juilliard, you know, friends, and we're much friendlier to each other now. Mm. It's kind of weird. We've all grown up, you know, yeah. found our place, and we're okay now. So, how did you end up here in Sacramento? After all of ah, it's a, it's a long story. So, I met my husband Richard at, at Juilliard, like on the first day of school, mm. and then. Um, so we've dated for like 10 years before we got married. And he's a pianist as well. He's a pianist. He's a very funny no, so pianist. So what's that like at home? Do you guys compete <laughs> with each other? No, no, but we... we You're like, fly I, the bumblebee, 46 yeah, yeah, yeah. seconds. Yeah, <laughs> No, no. But we, we did have at one point three grand pianos. Yeah. And our house is, you know, three bedroom, one bath, you know, 1,500 square foot yeah. house. That's there are more of, pianos than, a lot you of know, piano. people. Like, do you just ever go home and go, man, it's just... <laughs> How about some Ariana Grande tonight? I don't want to hear any more Beethoven sonatas. Oh, we never listen to music. Oh, you, know? you don't? Yeah, yeah it's just like enough. we eat in peace and quiet. <laughs> <laughs> we don't turn on music because yeah. we're, yeah, it's we just saturated with it. Yeah, we want our ears you to have rest. You students all day. And, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, a lot of teaching. And yeah. so, if, so when, I, when you know we decided to get married, he had he teaches in, uh, at the Sacramento State University. Mm -hmm. uh, he had that job already for a few years. So I decided to move out here. Um, I was the free one. So, but I traveled a lot um, before I finally really lived live here permanently. Uh, in the beginning, I was traveling to Denmark because I had a piano trio based in Denmark. And so I was there four months out of a year just performing. Yeah. 
So you do chamber music and solo concerts, quite mm -hmm. a bit of that. But then I also saw you played a movie soundtrack recently, right? A, an, for an internment. Yes, for a friend. Y yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, that was um, uh, uh, of my friend Haruko Sakakibara, who was uh, very much involved in that. And she wrote the music. And uh, uh, I, uh, myself, and you know Igor Verligan, my, yeah. uh, the violinist yeah. that I play with, we played the soundtrack for that. Yeah, that was fun. What's coming up? Coming up, uh, next week I'm going on a tour. Uh, of uh, South and East Coast, and finally Alaska. Chamber solo music. solo piano recitals and master class. And I think I'm uh, actually uh, doing one competition judging and then also a recording session. Yeah. Wow. So it's like all packed in there. So what, what are you, what's your program? What are you playing? Um, I'm playing uh, a program called Prints and Poetry because many pieces are based on uh, images, uh, prints, uh, and some are inspired by poems. And some of the music is the more from the standard repertoire, like the Liszt Dante Sonata or the Chopin Barcarolle. Those are old favorites. And I'm mixing that with two pieces that were written for me rather recently. One is by Sonny Nabel, who is a Sacramento native, now lives in New York. And he wrote for me a piece uh, a few years ago called 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Mm. It's a multimedia piece to go with the 36 uh, woodblock prints of Hokusai. Mm -hmm. um, you probably know yeah, that. Yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, it's 36 movements to go with that uh, images. And then the other piece is by um, uh, Uruguayan composer Miguel de Laguila, and which was just written for me this year. Actually, written for me and a few of my colleagues. We co-commissioned as a consortium uh, a piece of music for us. And where is he from? He's from Uruguay. Oh, okay. He now lives in Seattle. Yeah. yeah. So how do you go out? And look for people to write music for you, or do they usually come? To, the composers come to you and ask you. <laughs> well, I've only done it twice. Uh -huh. So, uh, first time, you know, Sunny and Nabel have been a great friend of mine uh, for many years. So, and I always loved his music. So that was an easy choice for me. Um, Miguel, um, Miguel, I first uh, came to know his music uh, in I think 2011. I had to ask my friend. Yeah, 2011. Um, I, uh, my friend, uh, colleague, bassoonist Scott Poole, and I played a song, a piece called Sunset Song, mm. which was really fun. And then we played another piece that Scott commissioned him uh, called Malambo in 2014. Really great piece. And then um, finally, I heard his piece called Submerged, at Talas Music Festival, where I teach, uh, he yeah, he was the. It was in Switzerland this past summer. He moved to Sarajevo, Bosnia. Oh, yeah. So um, Miguel was the artist in residence for the composer in residence, and he had this piece called Submerged, which is for harp, viola, and flute. Mm -hmm. and I was just so taken by that piece. The first hearing, which is kind of unusual for new music, I think. It takes sometimes it's because it's complex and um, the sound, the harmony is, takes, it usually takes me a while, but I was so caught by it. And then I wanted to play some pieces by him for solo piano. And there isn't really much. And... Um, so when he was asked back to come back this year to Sarajevo, to the Talas Festival, I thought, hmm, that would be really nice if you could write me a piece. Yeah. I think it really varies. Yeah. Um, we did different tiers. Yeah. Um, tier one, uh, tier two, tier three, which comes with different benefits and uh, like different rights. Like I, I did peer, uh, tier one and I had another kind of a, uh, Pianist, but more of a non-performing pianist who is a really a patron, mm -hmm. commit at tier one. And then there were a few other people doing tier two, tier three. Mm -hmm. Tier one is a $1,000 mm -hmm. commitment.
but then I get to do the world premiere. Yeah. Yeah, and I get to do the first uh, recording. I, I've been very lucky to play Sonny's piece, um, The 36 Views of Mount Fuji. I've been doing it for, maybe I've played it 14 times now, and I'm going to play a few more times, and we're going to record it. Yeah, th 36 Views of Mount Fuji takes 26 minutes to play. Oh, wow. It's a huge piece, yeah. So I think um, Miguel's piece. So what is the title of Miguel's piece? It's called Invisibles. Um, so uh, Miguel and I had discussion about what the piece should be about. And, and when I found out that we're moving to Sarajevo and the history, rather dark history of Sarajevo, rather violent of the recent history. And then I was reading, um, I read Japanese newspapers still to keep up my <laughs> Japanese reading and writing. I was reading so many um, articles about you know, violent, the, the wars, and so is there any ways that we can kind of have this message, you know, of peace for the, the people? So um, Miguel chose this poem by a Spanish symbolist, um, Antonio Machado. Um, and so the piece has a, a poem to go with it, and each movement, um, has parts of the poem printed on the score. Should I read this poem? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, the first movement, it starts out with, the plaza has a tower, the tower has a balcony. That's it, and dot, dot, dot. Second movement, it says, the balcony has a lady, the lady, a white flower, dot, dot, dot. The third movement, which is the longest movement, and it's probably the most violent move movement. It says, uh, there passed a man, nobody knows why, and he took away the plaza, with its tower, its balcony, with its balcony, and its lady. Its lady, her white, and her white flower. I don't know if it's about the peace, I think it is about the violence, and, but also, you know, the, the violence, the, the history of the violence in Sarajevo is rather raw. It's very much still there in the minds of people. I was so struck by um, people walking on the street. I, was, I had no idea what to expect when I was going to Sarajevo. And um, first week, I kept looking at people's faces. And um, there are a lot of tourists, and there's a lot of young people they're, they're, they look like us. They look like the rest of us. But the people in their 60s, a lot of them have a very different expression. Mm -hmm. Like they have gone through something so awful. Uh, yes. The lines and the eyes. You don't recover from that. Yeah. So um, we didn't really want to shove it in their face with anything. Because what do we know? Really, yeah, I mean, we were not there. So it's just a message. Three movements, and it's all played in a row. And um, the second movement, um, maybe I should show you, because um, <coughs> second movement begins when you hear this trill. And then, this is supposed to symbolize the balcony. So you will know when the second movement begins. And I think the third movement is pretty obvious because it's so shocking. Yeah. Is, there, is there structure within each of the movements as well? Well, the first movement is, is a, um, a dance. Mm -hmm. It's a... Uh, and it's sequential, and it's very Latin in flavor. Um, second movement is ABA, so you'll hear a middle section. The middle section has the most poignant melody and the deep thoughts of this lady. And the reason I wore this T-shirt, you're probably thinking, why, am I, why, why is she dressed so casually? Um, it's because this is a T-shirt from the festival 
Palace Festival this past summer. And then when this was sent to me, I opened it and I thought, my goodness, this is such a weird note because there's so many leisure lines, right? Mm. It's like, what is that for? You know, it's, we don't have double bass coming this year and <laughs> it's so low. I, I ex, you know, I assumed they was low. And then when I got there, they told me, the director told me, you know, that's your piece. <laughs> Oh, and really? I had no idea because, oh, really? because when you learn a piece of music, I think you digest it in a different way. And this is from the most poignant part of the piece, the most important part of the piece has this passage. Oh, that's right. So that, that's why I wore this today to show you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you learn a piece then, are you, are you, uh, do you break it down into kind of a harmonic structure and memorize it in that way and, and think about, you know, uh, in a very concrete way? Or are you working on it in that? I think it's so many multi-layer. There's definitely an analytical aspect, harmonically, structurally, uh, texturally. Um, and there is this digestion period. I mean, first you have to learn the notes, and of course you have to be able to play it. But after that, there's this huge, long period that you have to digest. Um, and it, when it's there, it's there. You know it's there and you have to digest for a long time. I'm still in process with this yeah. piece. It's, yeah. it's a difficult piece. Yeah. yeah, and it's part of the difficulty with piece that is new is that nobody knows how it goes. It's not in our mind as a history of music, right? So that's, it's, it's a both a freedom and a challenge.
Thank you.